morning. It's good to be with you. My name's Craig, and I get the privilege of ministering to you this morning and also leading this community. And I, I want to give you a personal invitation this morning. It's a personal invitation because I'm asking, and it's inviting you to come and join me on an intentional journey over 10 months, starting this month, the third Friday, which is this Friday night. So Warren spoke about our plan for this year, and our plan this year is comprises, every good plan has three parts. The first part is going to two meetings. Sick, and how many of you enjoying that? Yeah. Hey, I reckon, so how's it going 10, 15? Are you enjoying that? Is it good? Good? You love getting up a little bit later and all of that? All right. You're a bit quieter, but anyway, we're not going to compare. All right. Just be yourself, right? Be real. So um, two meetings, Unite, or the first Wednesday, it's strategy, a plan, part of our plan. And the third one is an intentional moment of training and helping people into their God-given destiny, and we're calling that Multiply. And it is uh, something that I will be leading and hosting and working through. And so I have a personal invitation to you, men and women, so it's open. If you are between the ages of 19 and 30-ish. <laughs> All right. Because I wanted to say 30 and they got somebody 33, 31, but I'm 33. But can I come? Look, you're as young as you want to be. All right. So you can come. All right, but I'm going 19 to 30, young person, young uh, woman, man, to join us in an intentional t time, and you are looking to become a young champion. You see, David, it was described in the book of Acts, chapter 30, it's kind of a life verse that I have, is that David served the purposes of God. In fact, the TPT says he passionately served the purposes of God in his generation, and then he died. I said to Andy, that's what uh, you can put on my gravestone if I have one. Probably not because I'm going to probably be cremated or whatever. I don't care what happens to me afterwards, my body. But I want to be remembered, and so if I live up to passionately serving the purposes of God in my generation, that's what I'd love to be remembered as. And David was a young champion, killed a lion, killed a bear, took down a giant. He was in his teenage years. He was a young champion that served the purposes and plans of God. But he was also a living legend. Even right into his old age, his kingdom as king was 40 years long. 40 years he was king of Israel. He was the type of Christ. And so I want to take a second group as well, which is, those from the age of 40-ish, you can be young as you like or old as you like, all right? 40-ish, all the way through plus, whatever it is, okay? But in the, those who would be prepared to help a younger generation fulfill what God has called them to, to raise up young champions and to be used by God. You may be saying, I'm not you know, able to do that. I don't feel uh, uh, equipped. Or, or maybe you haven't thought that you could actually even be used by God. I believe, and I carry this pain in my heart for the generation that I'm a part of, is that it seems to be that we fade out instead of being fired up and retired, not retired. When I say retires, R-E-T-Y. R -E. We need to be retired, some of us older guys, because we've still got a plot to play. And I want to bring these two generations together in an intentional moment of working through. It's going to require commitment. It's going to require working through some stuff. It is not going to be a holiday. It's, it's, an, it's an opportunity to move into the plans and purposes that God has for you. And I'm having an open night on Friday night. It's open to all. No strings at Attached. You can come and have a look. You can come and see. I haven't got the time to explain it all, but Friday night we will do it in detail. And then you can either go, I'm signing up for this or not for me this year. And that's fine. All I am trusting God for is I get at least 10 young champions or 10 younger people that want to go, we want to be young champions, and we get 10 living legends. 
If I can just get 10 this year or from each, I believe we can change the city. <laughs> Amen? Parents, check your phones throughout the meeting. Are there some kids giving trouble? All right. Now, I have got less than 20 minutes to preach, so what am I going to do? I think I'll just try and prophesy this morning. How are we doing? Are we okay? Jesus, will you help me? You minister with power and authority. I'm going to start reading from the book of Acts. I had um, prepared a message this week uh, from Acts chapter 10. It's a beautiful chapter. It's a pivotal chapter. It's a chapter when uh, God poured out His Spirit and opened the door to the Gentiles. Any Jewish people here this morning? So for most of all of us, we are the Gentiles, and I say thank God for chapter 10 in Acts. Thank God that He opened the door to us Gentiles so that we could experience, and it's incredible, and I want to speak on that next week as you look at it, chapter 8, 9, and 10. You see that God saves three different people. One, a black man, two, a Jewish man, and then chapter 10, a Gentile man. And that is the, the same as when we all descended from Noah and his son, Ham, Sheph, and Japheth. And God does this again, and he brings the whole world, for God loved the whole world. And he's dealing with prejudice. And so I was going to be speaking on prejudice, and I, I, I feel like if I get that next week, the Holy Spirit allows it that next week. But bring a friend, anybody battling with racism, because prejudice is the root of racism. Because we want to prejudge. Prejudice is prejudge. Now I'm beginning to preach the message that I, I know the Holy Spirit said no. So uh, let me move on to, to Acts chapter 9. All right, so God spoke to me through this, and I believe that He is going to encourage you, strengthen you, and that it's going to be a blessing. How many are ready for a blessing outpouring, needing healing in God? Come on. All right, so chapter 9, verse 32, it says, As Peter was ministering from place to place, say place to place. He visited God's devoted ones, another version says saints, in the village of Lydda. And he met a man there named Aeneas, who had been paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus, the anointed one, instantly and divinely heals you. Now, get up and make your bed. And all at once he stood up at it on his feet, and when all the people, say all the people, all the people of Lydda and Sharon saw him. They became believers in the Lord. Amazing, amazing testimony. I want to tell you that God wants to do something unique and divine in us and in you so that when you experience the touch of God, all of those around you will become believers. I believe in households of salvation. I believe that you can stand and ask God as a single person, as, a, as, a, as, a, as if you're the only person in your family that has experienced the, the salvation of God, that you can believe and trust God to bring the salvation of your entire family. Believe that there are people here this morning whose wives or husbands don't believe and don't come to church or once did that, but they are observing and waiting for your transformation. And when we are transformed they will be transformed. When they transformed, our nation will be transformed and this world will be different. So, Father, I'm asking that you would come now, the anointed one, Jesus Christ, and would you come and bring healing and your power and your presence. As we've sung, your presence is an open door. So we walk through by faith now into your presence and we take hold of the breakthrough that you have for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning I am speaking, and the title of my message is Make Your Bed. Make Your Bed. I don't know if that's now bringing back a little bit of, you know, your mother's a voice in your ears or something. Is that, you know, what is it about making a bed? What is it about in our teenage years, we just hate making a bed? Or even in my 50s, I hate making a bed. 
I don't know what it is, you know. So Andy and I have got this kind of deal that um, he who gets out of bed last makes the bed. So that's why I'm always the first out of bed. <laughs> Except on the days that she runs. And she's a runner, and sometimes she slips out of bed, and I'm going, oh, I'm so glad I'm not running over, and now I have to make the bed. I ain't making the bed. I don't know what it is. Maybe it was the army or whatever it is, making the bed. I like. And I don't know what about, you know, this new day called trend. There's kind of seemingly a competition to see how many pillows one can put on a bed. You know, big pillows, small pillows, long pillows, round pillows, fat pillows, as long as you've got a lot of pillows on the bed. I don't know what it's all about, but, you know, you just got to have, you know, how many of you love having a lot of pillows on your bed? Or how many husbands have got this problem at night that it takes you half an hour to get into bed? <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, oh, no, you know, I remember saying, we don't have that problem. We only got one pillow on the other bed. You can understand why now, but, you know, um, we were staying with these folk, and they, the uh, literally the whole bed was covered in pillows. I'm not joking, the whole bed. You know, it took me half an hour, one, two, three. I tell you, it was like a hurricane or an earthquake had gone through the bedroom. And the only problem was that night I couldn't sleep because I thought, I've got to make the bed in the morning. Now am I going to get this pillow? Where was that pillow? Take a photo. You know, it's like, you know, you're staying with a guest. You want to honor them. You know, you know that they're coming to see this Craig make his bed. And then it's like, ah, you know. I was, but genuinely, I was visiting some friends the other day, and I was, it was by myself, so Andy wasn't with me, and I'm telling you, this bed was covered in pillows, you know? So this is what I did. Honestly, I just took the pillows off half the bed, and I kept it, and I was like, the whole night, didn't turn myself, I was just like, I can't push the pillows off the bed, because if I do that, I won't know how to put the pillows back again, you know? So the next morning, I just made the bed, and then I copied the other side. Doom, 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 doom. <laughs> Make your bed. You know, there's something about getting in a nice, crisp, clean bed, isn't there? It's just like those nice, you know. The longer you stay in a bed, though, the worse it becomes like a mess. Peter, he's going from place to place, and he comes across a man that is stuck in his bed for eight years. He's in a mess. He's in this place. And Peter has been going from place to place. And he comes to this place in this time, and he brings divine healing. And I want to have a look at this portion of Scripture very quickly, some meditations that I felt that God has encouraged me in, and I want to minister this morning. Having gone from place to place and gone through some things, I want to, and trusting and believing by faith, knowing the healer is here, that he's going to bring divine healing and wholeness to many this morning. So let's take it just in a, a, a few things there as we pop through the scripture. And so we see here the first thing is Peter goes from place to place. Well, one of the other versions is, is he, he went from here to there. Actually, if you look at the Greek and the understanding of that, it was he was going through. So he went through to go through to go through. Friends, I don't know what you are going through right now. I don't know where you are and in what circumstances or where you are. And you may be going through. And you know what? Some part of what I have found after I celebrate 50 years of being a son of God this year. In August, I think, in 1969, I gave my life to Christ next to my mother's bed. And you know, 50 years. But you know what I've kind of seen? Is that there is something of a mundane in the following of Christ, going place to place. You know, there's a big difference between chapter 3 and chapter 9. And there's a good many years between those two occurrences when Peter heals a lame man because his ankles had been, you know, paralyzed, whatever. And as we heard last week, he got into the river and he was healed. As he put out his hand and pulled him to wholeness, is that the next kind of miracle we see of Peter? And yes, it does describe Peter, his shadow, just even healing people. But the next description of the powerful healing that Peter has is in chapter 9. And Peter's been going place to place. And I want to say to us as followers of Christ is that you've got to keep going from place to place. You've got to keep going through what you're going through. 
And the reason you've got to keep going through what you're going through is because there's somebody waiting on the other side of your going through that is waiting for you to go through what you're going through so that you can help them go through what they're going through. Did you understand that? Some of you did. Should I say it again? Because Andy said to me, that sounds confusing. Just stay with me. Remember, is that we got to keep going through what we're going through so that we can go through what we're going through to get to somebody else that is going through something so that we can help them go through what they're going through. That's about discipleship, isn't it? That's about what we want to do and multiply. It's about, you know what? I don't think that it's about how much, you know, people want to elevate the pastor, and it's not about that. It's about you and me as the priesthood of all believers going through what we're going through, and there's a little bit of Monday into that, going to place to place, and going through others week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out. I wish that miracles were like happening every day. And maybe that will come a day when it is. But I want to tell you that it's about going through what you're going through so that you can help someone else who's going through what they're going through. And so I want to encourage us this morning, and as followers of Christ, is that it, it requires perseverance, it requires faithfulness. Um, as I said, the, the great heartache of my that I carry about my generation is that we tend to fade out and get stuck in a place. I don't know what that place is, and maybe you have been a follower of Christ, but you've got stuck. And you know that there is more, and you know that you can be of help to someone else, but you've got stuck. And maybe you're just like Aeneas, who has got bedridden. You know, the difference between chapter three's miracle is the man had been crippled for 40 years. From his birth, and he was 40 years old, and he was crippled, and Peter comes and he says, yeah, woo, and he pulls him up. But in chapter 9, this man had only been crippled for eight years. And I think that something, sometimes things happen, life happens to us, and we kind of get stuck. And we make a bed for ourselves, and we begin to live in a bed that we should be resting in, not living in. The interesting thing for me is that the Holy Spirit through the doctor, to Dr. Luke gives specifics about this. He says that he comes across a little village called Lida. Now, Lida means strife. It means turmoil. It can mean a conflict. It has a place of, of a conflict. Um, and uh, uh, you see, maybe I should just abandon notes and just try, and, otherwise I'll never finish. So it's conflict. There's turmoil. There's a place of strife. And I don't know, you may be in a place of strife this morning. You may have started something. Maybe it is eight years. I do believe there's someone here this morning that if you go back, you've been stuck in for eight years. And this morning, the Holy Spirit is coming and saying, I want to set you free. I want to pull you out of your bed. And it's make your bed. Today's the day you're going to make your bed. But Lida was in a place called Sharon, in a region called Sharon. And Sharon is this beautiful valley. It's a beautiful plain. Andy and I have had the privilege of going there. And it's a, it's a fruitful place. And you may be in a place of strife, but in a region of great fruitfulness. But you're stuck. In Song of Solomon, it says, describing a picture of Jesus as he was the rose of Sharon. There is this beautiful place. There is this promise of God for us to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. But we are stuck in a bed in the limitations of our weaknesses and our shortcomings. Things have cut in upon us, chopped our legs from underneath us, and paralyzed us into a bed. And this morning, the healer is here, and he's wanting to say, make your bed. Make your bed. Aeneas, it's a funny name, is it? I don't even know if I'm getting that one right. Aeneas, I just, it's like, huh? It's like, but you know what his name means? His name means to be praised, to be lauded. He comes from, named after a victorious conqueror. And here we are, that we are more than Helping me, come on. We are more than in 
Christ Jesus. In other words, here was a man who was to be praised, lauded. He was a, to be a victorious conqueror. He was one that people would want to go, hey, look what he did. He's such a great guy. Whoa. He, was be, he should be there, but he was crippled, paralyzed in a bed. The victorious conqueror had been conquered. I don't know what's happening with you in 21.9. Are you crushing 21.9? Or is 21.9 crushing you? Are you feeling like this place? You know, this paralyzed, it's paraleo, it comes weak knees. It can also mean dissolve. You ever felt like your life is dissolving? You know, I think when you hit 50, you feel like, whoo this effervescent pull is really giving it gears now. You know, you know when you, you stick those effervescent ones in the thing, and it goes slowly, and then the next thing, and, and I don't know, Andy and I are kind of feeling like that. It's just like, hey, our lives are dissolving very quickly. There ain't much time left. Or maybe, you know what I find? How many of you are finding your finances are dissolving quite quickly? <laughs> you know, eh? It's just like, whoa, they're gone. <laughs> maybe a relationship has dissolved. Maybe there's this feeling of this, everything is just dissolving around me. My emotions, my feelings, whatever it is, you feel like, oh! And you're paralyzed, and you're stuck in a bed. And this morning I'll come and say, make your bed. And the reason I say that is because, you know, Andy and I, we, we've been going from place to place. And the reason, well, let me just say about Peter, was Peter was going from place to place. Because if you read the, the chapter 8 before here, you read about a guy called Philip. Now, Philip... He was an evangelist, and he would go from one place. He went down to a little town in Samaria, preach the gospel. Everybody gets saved. There's like such chaos. They have to send Peter and John down there to bring about a little bit of, you know, building and keeping things together. And so he goes down. They go down there, and the Holy Spirit falls. And then the Spirit of God comes on Philip and says, now go south out of Jerusalem. So Philip goes south, and now he's cruising, in this, and he finds an a Ethiopian eunuch, this descendant of Ham, this black man, and, and, and he's riding a chariot, and he can't understand the scripture, and Philip is running alongside the chariot, and he's going, like, do you understand that? And, and, and like, he invites him up, and then he goes and baptizes him, and as he comes out the water, Philip is gone. He gets transported by the Holy Spirit, and he lands in a town very close to Lydda. And the Holy Spirit begins to tell him, okay, go here, go there, go here. And so he goes all the way up the coast, all the way to Caesarea. And the Bible says that he visited all the towns. Yeah, it was this evangelist. Man, he was preaching, people getting saved, churches are being born. And here it is. He probably goes through Lydda because there's a group of saints there when Peter gets there. Peter's going from place to place just, you know, fixing up things. He is an apostle. That's what apostles do. They, they build. Apostles set things in order. Apostles come and ordain people into leadership, and they work, and they bring people into their plans and purposes, and then they move to another place, and they go. And that's what Andy and I have been doing. We've just been going from place to place, and we went to Rustenburg last year, and I was just going out there to Rustenburg to help a few people, to help a church that was stuck in a bed, in a mess, in strife, unfruitful. And we began to come in there and help them and get people up and get them out. And, and, and eventually, as you know, some of you would know, is that they asked us, hey, can we come part of the family? We just love urban life. And we said, okay. And we prayed about it. We felt this is it. This is God. And so we started. In two months, we were going and sending worship team. And I think we rejoiced and said, wow, this is brilliant. And we help people out of their beds. And the more people got out of their beds, the some of those who wouldn't get out their beds got bitter and twisted. You see, in that region, as it says, Lida was part of Sharon, but it was in part of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, Benjamin is the tribe, the people of that region. And if you go back into Judges, you read one of the most horrific stories of all the Bible is when the brothers began to fight and the Benjaminites went up and fought against their brothers. And they got one victory and they got another victory. And then the brothers said, enough. And they came and just actually killed all the men. And they stood at a place where that whole tribe could have been wiped out. And they had to come up with a very creative plan in sending some of their men to go and, and help 
Make sure that the tribe of Benjamin doesn't fade out of history. And the reason, and what we learned from that, it was they, they were in strife. They fought each other. There was, there was a, a family feud. And so within this family of, of Rustenburg, a couple of guys got together, and they came and started accusing me of trying to steal their money and their building. And every time, all I'd done is just go and serve. I was like, oh, I went to this place. And I was like, oh, God, they don't like me anymore. And they don't like urban life, and they accused us of all sorts of things. And it's like, you know, if you know me, I'm a street fighter. I'm a wild dog. I'm just going to hold on. I'm a bull terrier. I'm going to, and I'm not going to let go. And then, you know, and if the harder they come, the harder I'm going to go. And then God had to teach me a few things in this place. Because in this place, I just wanted to fight. And God says, if you want to win, you win by losing. Lay down your life. And I had to learn that eight in the scripture is a new beginning. And here was a man paralyzed for eight years, and God wants to give, God wanted to give him a new beginning, not a second chance. And here God had to teach me, he's like, you're gonna win by losing. And I'm going, no, I'm gonna fight. And I'm gonna fight, and they threatened to take me to court and take us to court and all that. And I just go like, why? Well, I'm not gonna drag the name of Jesus through the courts of law when the scriptures clearly tell us not to. So I had to face this decision, and we faced this decision as an eldership. And he's going, you know what? You win by losing. You win by laying down your life. You die so that God can bring a new beginning. I don't know what you're holding on to, friends. I don't know what's stopping you from laying down your life. I don't know. It's certain, many times. For me, it's pride. For me, it's many things. I was going through, I was going through things where there was long standing strongholds that had come from generations into, into, into my life and, and, and battled with them for years and years and years and having to find freedom. And I had to find out that freedom is not just being free from sin and death, but being free from the strongholds that the enemy would come. And I looked at and saw that as Peter, Peter got greater and greater freedom. And even as we see, as we read on in the book of Acts, he faced this time where he had to understand that he had the freedom to eat pork. I don't know what cultural stronghold you may be hanging on to. And that's it. We come to Christ and we find freedom and we get abundant life. But there are many things that come through bloodlines and strongholds and things that have come through our culture. Whether it's black or white, I'm not being it is. It's just that I'm telling you, it's coming from a, a long line of ministers of the gospel. It doesn't matter. I had to come and go, oh, let me lay down my life. Lord, would you deliver me a strong You know what I found is the gift of forgiveness. One of the greatest things is being forgiven by my Father in heaven. My sins canceled, removed, but being forgiven by one another and being forgiven by my wife and forgiven by others and going, oh, God, just getting a fresh revelation of forgiveness. What are you going through, friends? Isn't it time to make your bed? I love the fact that Peter doesn't come and say, Aeneas. He doesn't say, you're a victorious conqueror, now stand up and walk and stand up and fight. He says, Aeneas, rise. The word rise is the same word used for resurrection. The same word when it says about Jesus, rose again. As we sang this evening, this morning, that says, in a grave, he began to breathe. <laughs> it is such a beautiful phrase. Because, friends, I think that some of us are in graves. You know, they say that there's only one difference between a grave and a rut, and that it's length. And we maybe found ourselves and we're stuck in a rut. Well, it's just a grave. It's a bed and we need to close it up. We need to make it. We need to walk out of it. And it's not about uh, Peter grabbing hold of a lame man's hand and pulling him up. It's about faith in the word that he brought. And my 
Friends, this morning, I've been praying and saying, I'm trusting that through the words that have been shared this morning, that faith is, be- is coming into every one of our hearts. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And through the Word of God and through these simple little meditations is that I'm trusting that the Word is exploding in faith, by faith in your heart, that this morning you're beginning to go, hey, I want to rise. I, I-, I want to stand. I, I want to get up. I want to make my bed. Beds have limitations. Beds are the places of weakness. Beds, if you want to go anywhere, they would have had to carry him in his bed. Who wants to live in a bed when we've been destined to go from place to place to help others go through what they're going through? Come on. Life is too short. Life is not a dress rehearsal, friends. We've only got one life to live, and we've got to live it to the full, and we've got to become devoted to the purposes and to the plans of God. And it's time that we deal with our rubber knees. It's time that we deal with it. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12, it says this. It says, So be made strong even in your weakness. How many of you know that there's a weakness? There's a a shortcoming. (laughs) You kind of go like, oh, in my weakness. It says, be made strong by lifting up your tired hands in prayer and worship. Friends, we're going to get a chance just now as we respond in worship to lift up our tired hands. And you're going, have you got weaknesses? It's time to lift it up to God. And it says, and strengthen your weak knees. One of the, one of the, the, the translation says rubber knees. You feel like you've got rubber knees? You feel like you're paralyzed, stuck in a bed. It says, for as you keep walking forward. Say, keep walking forward. You see, many of us are waiting for God to come and heal us. And we sit in our bed, we sit in the limitations, and we stand there, we sit there, or we wallow there, and we're wallowing in our weaknesses. And I'm gonna ask you this question, is where do you run to? What weakness do you run to when you're tired or when you're offended or when there's something that comes? What weakness do you run to? I realized that there were some weaknesses that I ran to. There were some things that I did, and I've said to Andy, call me out of it. Call me out of it. I realized that I can go to somewhere else in my mind and that I'm not present. I said, call me out of it. Why? Because I run to those things. Why? Because I can hide behind them. I can hide in my bed. I can hide in my weakness. I can hide. Sorry, I don't do that. Sorry, I can't do that. Oh, that's not me. What are you hiding behind? What are you hiding in that God wants to set you free from? What is it this morning is that I'm calling with a, with a word of faith and saying, make your bed. So as you keep walking forward on God's path, your stumbling ways, ways will be divinely healed. Friends, this is the encouragement that I want to give you this morning. Is that if you and me would rise out of our bed, make it so that we never go back there. That's what he was meaning. When Peter said, make your bed, spread it out, take it out, throw it away, get rid of it. Never go back there. But keep walking forward. Make a decision today to continue to the mundane and go from place to place. And I'm telling you, friends, if you will go through what you're going through so that you can help someone else go through what they're going through, your feeble knees will be strengthened. When people come and say, listen, I want you to do that, they go, like, I'm not able. I say, just keep walking forward. Just keep walking forward. Just keep doing it. Keep doing it. And you can wallow in your brokenness. You can wallow in your, in your weakness. You can wallow in your shortcomings. And you can stay in the bed for as long as you like. But this morning, the Spirit of God is saying, make your bed. But before he says that, he says, rise. And you can only rise if you acknowledge that you've died. You can only be resurrected if you know that you've actually dead. And so I'm gonna ask you this morning, right now, if that's you and you're going, the Spirit of God is speaking and you know that this is a word for you and that you know that you're today to stand up, rise up and walk out and make your bed and keep walking, is that in this moment, 
If we can just have our heads bowed for a moment. I'm going to pray. And I want you to make a decision to die to yourself. I want you to make a decision to win by losing. I want you to make a decision to lay down your life. I want you to make a decision to surrender and allow the Spirit of Christ, the divine anointed healer, to come and heal you this morning. He'll heal you if you're physically sick this morning. By his stripes, you will be healed. If you're emotionally sick or unwell, your soul is not well, that he would come with his divine grace and bring healing. If you're spiritually sick this morning, that he would come. I'm asking you, divine healer, to bring healing. Can I just have those lights down, please, like we do in worship? So if you can just put that setting on. Thank you. And I'm gonna ask you, and I believe that this is Christ, the anointed healer, is coming this morning. And I'm gonna ask you to rise. And I want you If this word has penetrated your spirit and you're responding and you prayed that prayer to die, that I'm gonna ask you now to rise and stand right where you are. Don't worry about anyone around you, just rise. And say, I'm rising and I'm gonna make my bed today. Today I'm gonna walk out. Today I'm not going back. Today I'm rising. Today I am rising. Today is the day of new beginnings and you needing a new beginning whether it's emotionally relationally financially you needing a new beginning beginning of purpose and the plans of God you needing healing you're going to rise right now and you're going to make our bed so gracious God and our heavenly father you see each one of us that have risen we're stepping up out of our beds we're stepping into a new beginning. I want to say to every one of you this morning, Christ, the anointed healer, heals you. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed this morning. Take it. Receive it. Receive your healing this morning. You healed. You healed. You healed. And now make a decision that from today, you're going to walk away. You're not going to walk back into that place. You're going to walk out of bitterness. You're going to stop fighting your family. You're going to stop doing that. You're going to walk out. You're going to go and help somebody. Be healed. Be healed. Just receive that healing from Christ the healer this morning. Let's respond.